Hello everybody, Mr. Bubba here, and I hope you guys are having a good weekend and enjoying whatever you are doing at the moment. Um, we are going to pick up with Reading Restart, chapter 19 and 20. So we're doing our two weekend chapter reads right now, all in one video. If this is too long, don't worry, you can pause it, come back to it anytime you want, okay? So, let's jump back in. We left off on Friday with um, the conversation we had during our morning meeting about what does reconciliation mean? We kind of discussed that, like forgiveness, but it's a bigger form of forgiveness in some ways. Like uh, those, if you think about the size of a problem chart that we use in our classroom all the time, you know, you don't. There's those problems that are so small you don't even need to respond to them. You know, that's not reconciliation. That's not forgiving someone. So, for example, if like you know someone takes your ball on the playground and you sort it out real quick, that's not might be some forgiveness involved, but that's not really reconciliation, right? To reconcile something uh, with something is like a deeper form of forgiveness. Like you, it's a process. You know, it's something you have to work towards. And we talked about that no, that notion, that idea, which is becoming a theme of the story, right? Reconciliation, forgiveness, uh, especially when it comes between two characters like Chase and Joel, right? We're not talking about one bad incident. We're talking about a, a year's worth of trauma involved between these two characters and the conflict that's creating between chase and joel between chase and chase himself remembering who he was and who he used to be hold on one second reggie um who he was and who, who chase was now who he is now and who he used to be right chase is learning more and more about his past and really not liking who he used to be and that's something that chase has to reconcile and carry with him. And we also talked about reconciliation between Chase and Joel Weber's family and how Shoshana is kind of pushing everybody in an uncomfortable way to kind of force them to reconcile with this, kind of force them to accept Chase as a different person now and kind of push the issue and you know kind of say he is different and we, we kind of have to deal with that now. We have to find a way to still occupy the same space and work together. Um, so interesting stuff, lots of deep thoughts to think about, lots of stuff to reflect on, um, in the story. Let's see where it goes now. We're reading chapter 19. We're starting off with a new perspective. We had never really heard from Bear Bradsky before. Maybe there was one chapter earlier, but I know we've heard from Aaron, but this is from Bear Bradsky's perspective. When the announcement comes that there's an assembly, we're all psyched. Why wouldn't we be? It's like a get-out-of-jail-free card for the whole morning of classes. What's the assembly about? Who knows? Who cares? In the auditorium, the big screen is set out. The perfect chance to catch a nap for a guy who is playing game, video games. I'm sorry, I missed my line. I'm going to try that again. In the auditorium, the big screen is set up. That means they'll be turning the lights out. The perfect chance to catch up a nap to catch a nap for a guy who was playing video games until 3 a.m. last night. Aaron is way ahead of me. He drapes himself into his seat, his legs dangling over the back of the chair in front of him, his arms spread wide out. I fight my way to be beside him, and we wrestle for position. Hey! exclaims the loser in the row ahead of us, the one with Aaron's size 14 construction boot hanging over his shoulder. But when he sees who he's talking to, he gets real quiet real fast. He and his friends wander off, looking for someplace else to sit. I flake out next to Aaron. Wake me up when it's over, he mumbles, already half asleep. You're the one who's going to be awaking me, I retort, and we exchange a few rabbit punches before settling in for the big snooze fest. Then comes the surprise. The whole purpose of this assembly is so we can congratulate Chase Ambrose and Shawshanna Weber for the amazing video they made for some stupid contest or other. That's all I need, to watch the principal and teachers lining up to worship the kid who used to be just a guy like me until he fell on his head and suddenly became smart. It gets worse. We're not just going to worship the video, we're going to watch it. All 40 minutes of it. Well, forget sleeping now. I'm too ticked off. 
Even Aaron is sitting bolt upright, staring in outrage at Ambrose and the Weber chick on stage. The video starts. That's when my head really explodes. The thing is called Warrior. And it's about that geezer, Soloway. The meanest old Dumbledore in the entire Greybeard Motel. No wonder the two of them spent so much time with the guy. Beside me, I can practically see steam coming out of Aaron's ears. It's not enough for him to make us look like jerks by doing community service when he doesn't have to, he seethes. No, he has to make a documentary about the place so he can brag to the whole world and with, Shosh and with Shoshana Weber from the same family that got us put on community service in the first place. And I thought that guy was my friend. But Soloway, I demand, what's up with that? Yeah, he agrees. A whole museum full of ancient fossils, and they have to pick the nasty old crab who complains to the nurses if his cookie is off-center on the plate. That's not what I mean, and you know it, I hiss. Why him, huh? Not just any old Dumbledore. Soloway. No way that's a coincidence. Chase doesn't know anything about that, Aaron reminds me. He's got amnesia. If he's got amnesia, I put in darkly, sounds a little convenient to me. Well, he's got amnesia enough to forget that he's our boy, Aaron says bitterly. I nod. He used to play football. Now he doesn't. He says he's coming back, but I think he's just stringing us along. He's partnered up with a Weber, and he's even getting buddy-buddy with Joel Weber. He's making it impossible to get along with him. He acts like he's changed, but he's really just cutting us out. On the screen, there's a close-up photo of a gleaming Medal of Honor. In the voiceover, Shoshana explains that this isn't the actual medal. Mr. Soloway won. Mr. Sol Mr. Wonderful Soloway isn't just a hero, he's modest too. He never wore the dumb thing because he didn't want people to feel bad that they don't have one. And over the years, he forgot where he put it. Yeah, right, I mutter. Shh, Aaron hisses. When it's finally over, Ambrose and the Weber chick get a five-minute standing ovation. That burns me up since I know for a fact that the other kids were just as bored as I was. They bring the whole video club up there, because they helped. Miss Lau reads out a letter from the head of the Greybeard Motel, thanking the filmmakers for their awesomeness and the school for having such awesome students. Puke. Aaron and I are sentenced to go to that place three days a week until we're practically old enough to check in there. And what do we get for it? yelled at. That's what. By nurses and double doors. Both. And Chase, who's worse than us, gets a love letter from the director. I've never been so happy to get back to a classroom. We can't just do nothing about this, I plead to Aaron as he takes the desk next to me. He's walking all over us and we're letting him. For the very first time, he doesn't look at me like I'm crazy. I've got an idea how we can jog his memory. You know, remind him who his real friends are. That's the end of chapter 18. I mean, sorry, chapter 19. Sounds like it's getting pretty intense between Aaron and Bear. They're definitely not happy about Chase's flip since he had his accident. And they're really, really uncomfortable with this video about Mr. Soloway. I wonder where that's gone. All right. Chapter 20, jumping straight in, we got Brendan Espinoza on the line. Leaf Man wasn't the hit I was hoping for. Even though it got a lot of YouTube views, for something to go viral, it has to reach a kind of critical mass, where suddenly everybody is talking about it. Poor Leaf Man just didn't have enough legs for that. The, bu the bummer is, as great as it was, Leafman sent me back big time with Kimberly. She's still nice to me, 
but it might be that she feels sorry for me because she thinks I'm crazy. I'm coming to the conclusion that our senses of humor aren't very compatible. That doesn't mean we aren't compatible, just that we probably won't like the same books, TV shows, movies, you know, that kind of stuff. Besides, she's still totally moon-faced over Chase. So compatibility isn't really an issue right now. The fact that she barely even notices me, that's an issue. Anyway, I've got an idea for a new video, and this one's going to knock her socks off. It doesn't depend so much on humor as creativity and special effects. It's called One Man Band. Picture this. The Hawassi Music Room. The camera films me pretending to play every instrument in the orchestra in front of a green screen. Then I use the video editing program to superimpose those images onto the various seats on the band risers until I've got a whole orchestra and they're all me. Presto, one man band. Joe helps me reserve the room for Thursday after school. The music department is so thrilled to have their star back that Miss Gilbride would have promised him her firstborn child. Besides, he's known to be a good kid. It's not like he's going to trash the risers or anything like that. Unfortunately, Chase isn't available to work the camera. He has to take a social studies test he missed due to a follow-up appointment with his falling off the roof doctor. This might be a blessing in disguise because A, Joel volunteers to fill in and he's a pretty good cameraman. B, Miss Gilbride wouldn't let Chase anywhere near her instruments. Amnesia or no. She's still mourning that piano like it was donated to the school by Beethoven himself. Also, C, Kimberly is always a little distracted when Chase is around. Maybe that's why she didn't get the humor in Leafman. Now, with Chase away writing that test, she'll be able to concentrate on me. I want to rent a tuxedo, since those orchestra guys really put on the Ritz. My mom won't spring for it, though, so I do the best I can. I take the light gray suit I wore to this kid's bar mitzvah and paint it with shoe polish. My white shirt has a bit of a stripe in it, but I'm pretty sure it won't show up on the camera. There'll be a lot of me, but luckily, we'll be all pretty small. I borrow a tie from my dad to make the whole ensemble more tux-like. When I come up out of the bathroom, all dressed up on, on Thursday, Kimberly wrinkles her nose. A very cute look for her. By the way, dude, you stink. What did you do? Take a bath in magic marker? It's shoe polish, I explain. It's not me. It's my clothes. I had to improvise formal wear. Why can't you wear normal clothes? Because an orchestra dress is fancy. But you're not in an orchestra. Well, if she doesn't pay any attention to me, it shouldn't come as a surprise that she doesn't read my texts either. On the way to the music room, I get her up to speed on one man band. Her comment is, you're dripping black gunk on the floor. Really? Uh-oh. There's a trail of shoe polish splatters all the way down the hallway. Too late to worry about that now. Once the video is in the can, I'll do my best to clean up after myself. I think rubbing alcohol works on that stuff. Or maybe nail polish remover. Joel is waiting for us inside the music room. He's already put the video club's green screen and set out all the instruments we're going to need. The flip, flip cam is mounted atop a tripod. Another reason why we don't need Chase's steady hand. Joel's got some extra lights plugged in with a spaghetti of power cords. We're ready to roll. For music, I've chosen a full orchestra version for, for He's a Go Jolly Good Fellow. Performed furiously in triple time. I'll add that in during the editing stage. I'll add that in during the editing stage. But I play it on my phone during filming so I have the time right while I'm trying to do my thing with the instruments. It's not such a big deal with the small stuff. Trumpet, clarinet, sax, flute, 
piccolo. But for violin and the string family, it's important that my bow should be moving to the right tempo. That goes double for trombone. The kettle drums, and especially the cymbals. If I go crash, then there'd better be a real crash. I know this song, Kimberly comments, after the music has been playing in an endless loop for at least 20 minutes of shooting. How come you pick such a lousy song? We're in the home stretch. Bassoon, French horn, and tuba. The tuba is last. I stare at it. It's the marching band kind, where you climb into the middle of it, and it's all around your body like a python. Wait a minute, I protest. Where's the regular one? Dented, Joel replies. Somebody dropped it down the stairs, and it's getting, it's out getting fixed. So it's this one or nothing. Well, you can't have an orchestra without a tuba. I squirm in and struggle to my feet. I swear the thing weighs more than I do. I'm no Hercules, but the kid who plays this thing in marching band is a four foot eight inch sixth grade girl. How does she lift it, much less have the breath left over to blow into it? Kimberly is reading me a little dubiously, so I give her my most confident look and announce, piece of cake. It comes out like I'm straining to pass a kidney stone. Not the effect I was reaching for. I put my lips to the mouthpiece and nod to Joel to start the flip cam, the final shot. The camera comes on. The double doors are kicked open. And before I can react, a tidal wave of white foam fills my field of vision. It hits me full in the face. It wouldn't normally be enough to knock me over, but with a heavy tuba bell suspended above my head, I overbalance and go down like a stone. There's a loud clang as the brass of the instrument strikes the metal edge of the riser. I hear a gasp of horror from Joel, and I and I soon I understand why. When I roll out of the stream of foam still wrapped in the tuba, I see Aaron Heikman and Bear Bratsky, each armed with one of the school's big silver fire extinguishers, spraying down the room and everything and everybody in it. Go away, Joel pleads in a quavering voice. Aaron laughs a nasty laugh. Well, if it isn't the loser, I don't think we ever welcomed you back to school. How rude of us. Welcome home, loser, Bear bellows, and blasts a jet of foam covering Joel from head to toe. I turn to Kimberly, who's standing there and of all things giggling. A lot, at long last, the girl has found something funny in one of my videos. She thinks it's part of the plan and doesn't even notice that we're under attack. Go get help, I bark at her. Yeah, get help, snorts Bear. Why don't you call your friend Chase? That makes sense to me. He's the only one with half a chance of taking on these two. Get Chase, I yell at Kimberly. Aaron laughs cruelly. And you're supposed to be smart? Who do you figured sent us here, geniuses? You think Chase doesn't remember the loser who got him put on community service? Bear adds. Go, I shout. He's in Mr. Solomon's room. A blast of foam silences me, and I go down again, still encircled by the tuba. Now my arms are pinned at my sides, and I can barely move. Not that I'd be much help standing up to those two Neanderthals. And if I'm up, and I'm if I'm upset, I can only imagine what they must be go, what must be going on in Joel's mind. After everything he's been through, he comes home only to find that it's starting all over again. Kimberly bolts past the two attackers and out the door. They make no move to stop her. Their focus is on me and mostly on Joel. Hey, check out all these instruments, Bear snickers, as if the band room is the last place anyone might expect to find such things. You think if I practice hard, I could become a musician like the great Joel Weber? He delivers a solid boot to the French horn, which skitters across the floor, kicking up a spray from the melting foam that covers half the room. 
<laughs> Please don't touch the instruments, Joel Limpers. I promised Miss Gilbride I'd be responsible for everything. Well, that does it. Once those two idiots see how to get a rise out of Joel, they're off to the races. Throwing flutes like many javelins and frisbeeing cymbals all around them. They roll trumpets and trombones onto the slop and send violins floating on top of it. A kettle drum is upended. Music stands are hurled in all directions. Sheet music is scattered like autumn leaves. Still stuck in the tuba, I try to scramble towards Aaron and Bear. I slip on wet paper and hit the floor with another clang. Joel has Aaron by the shoulders and is trying to pull him away from the instruments, but Aaron laughs and shakes him off. Suddenly, Chase barrels into the room, Kimberly hot on his heels. What's going on? He bellows. Dude, what took you so long? Aaron crows in unholy glee. We had to send the chick to get you. This is your best idea yet, adds Bear. He hefts his fire extinguisher and hands it to Chase. It's all yours, maestro. Chase looks totally blown away. I can't read his expression. Shocked or something else? It's your plan, Aaron reminds him. Bring it home. Chase is a statue, eyes wide. Bear gets impatient. Okay, I'll do it for you. He tries to take back the extinguisher but Chase tightens his grip and holds on. There's a vicious tug of war for the extinguisher. With a mighty yank, Chase wrenches it out of Bear's grasp. It swings free just as Joel rises from the floor where Aaron tossed him. With a thud, the heavy metal strikes Joel in the side of the face, and he drops back down onto the foam. Agitated voices sound out in the hallway. Six teachers burst into the music room, Miss Gilbride in the lead. What's going on here? She yells, taking in the wreckage all around her. Where's Joel Weber? With a groan, Joel sits up. The foam on his face can't disguise the fact that his left eye is already turning black and blue. That's when it hits me how this must seem to the teachers. The music room is a disaster area. Instruments, music stands, books, and papers are strewn everywhere. The whole place buried in foam. The school's three most notorious bullies are right there. One of them, Chase, still wields a fire extinguisher. And their number one target, Joel, is down on the floor with a rapidly swelling face obviously the victim of an assault. It isn't what it looks like, I gasp, and then bite my tongue. What if it's exactly what it looks like? The idea to send for Chase came from Aaron and Bear. Was that their plan all along? And was Chase the ringleader, just like those guys said? The teachers don't pay any attention to me. Their job is diffusing the crisis. Miss Gilbride rushes to Joel to see rushes Joel to see the nurse, and the other staff members march Aaron, Bear, and Chase off to the principal's office. Kimberly follows. Even now, her only concern is Chase. As quickly as that, I'm all alone, still trapped in the marching band's tuba, with a heavy sigh. I struggle up and try to shake myself out of the brass tentacles of this thing. It moves maybe an inch. I'm going to be here all night. As I continue to wriggle and squirm, dripping gray froth shoe polish onto the foam, I reflect that the worst part of this isn't being stuck in a tuba. It isn't that one man band is never going to happen. It's the sad fact that Kimberly could leave me in such a terrible state just because Chase is in trouble. And as soon as I think that, I realize the real worm around here has to be me. Wormier even than Aaron and Bear. 
I care more about my love life than the fact that my friend Chase might not be my friend after all. It isn't true, I scold myself. Chase used to be like that, but not anymore. Then there's the evidence of my own eyes and ears. The trashed band room. Another attack on poor Joel. Chase, right alongside his old wrecking crew, delivering the final blow. I sit down on the edge of the riser and hang my head, too depressed to wriggle anymore. The sound of wet sneakers squishing in the slop jolts me out of my melancholy. I look up to see Kimberly standing over me. She says, I thought you might need some help getting out of that thing. My heart soars. There's hope. That's the end of chapter 20. So we will pick up on Monday with Chase, Chase's perspective. That's quite an event right there, guys. I wonder what's going to happen here. Lots of different perspectives, and it looks like a, a much more situational conflict, right? We talked about internal conflict with Chase and Chase and um, a couple of other external conflicts mixing with internal conflicts. But now we got a big plot twist, so we'll see what happens. You guys, be safe, be good. I will talk to you all on Monday. And um, hopefully that update with the clever stuff was working. So if it's not, please take a picture. Please send it to me. And if you have any thoughts or reflections on the characters in the story that we're reading, send them my way. I'd love to hear your thoughts. We'll share them at our next morning meeting. Until then, you guys be good. Take care. And I'll talk to you soon, all right? Bye.